hi everyone. Thanks for coming to this breakout session. Our first speaker is Nick Fillion, who is going to be uh, talking to us about the vindication of computer simulation. Uh, Nick is a former uh, student at the philosophy department here at Western, so we're very proud that he's uh, made it to Simon Fraser University, where he's now an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Nick. It's good that I was clapping before I say anything, because after it, I might not be sure it will happen again. So, <laughs> I'm glad to be back uh, at the Rodman Institute, uh, where the tagline is engaging science. Now I move to an institution where the tagline is engaging the world. <laughs> Maybe my next job will be at a place where they, I don't know, engage the universe, or something like that. So, today, uh, I'm going to say mostly general things. It's, it was, it's based on a 90 minute talk that I tried to compress. Hopefully I'll be able to say a few things. Um, now as we all know, the use of uh, computer simulation in mathematics and mathematical sciences has increased a lot uh, over the last uh, few decades. Uh, and at the same time, uh, now I mean most people who do actual uh, modeling and science will have a pretty good working knowledge of how to attack various computational problems and how to write algorithms and uh, things like this. But at the same time, uh, it, it is a fact that the uh, understanding of why those methods actually work when they do and uh, when we should expect them to fail is lagging a little bit behind this uh, serious uh, increase in the amount of uh, computer simulation. So in philosophy of science, this has not been uh, considered very much. But fortunately, uh, uh, in the literature on uh, philosophy of climate science, uh, this uh, sort of uh, uh, prominence of computer simulation has played a much bigger role. Uh, and um, so I don't know very much about climate science, but this is really what has uh, attracted me to, uh, to say something in this uh, conference. Uh, so the first thing that strikes us when we use computer simulation is that they work, and we don't really understand why. Often we, we would not expect them to work, and they still do. Uh, Richard Hamming, a great numerical ana uh, analyst, uh, has a paper uh, uh, on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, and he uh, talks about it from a computational point of view. He says, my first real experience in the use of mathematics to predict things in the real world was in connection with the design of atomic bombs during the Second World War. How is it that the numbers we so patiently computed on the primitive relay computers agreed so well with what happened on the first test shot at Alma Gordon? There were and could be no small scale experiments to check the computations directly. This was not an isolated phenomenon. Constantly, what we predict from the manipulation of mathematical symbols is realized in the real world. Many people have this sort of experience, and often it results in a sort of a great enthusiasm and, confi and confidence about the results of computer simulation. However, they do not always uh, work all that nicely. And Leo Kadenov has a very nice paper in which he this describes a phenomenon called the optimization of enthusiasm and misjudgment. <laughs> so what we should not forget is that the numerical methods which underlie computer simulations uh, give us approximate solutions at best and can also lead to extremely misleading uh, results. And then the question is, how do we try to, in, well, to justify uh, those results? So I will try to talk a little bit about what the nature of this justification would be and how to think about it uh, uh, in relation to uh, the philosophy of science literature. So this talk will be more on the philosophy side than on the uh, math side. So in the literature on the epistemology of computer simulation, there's a number of claims that are made uh, that the justification of computer simulation is uh, to some extent similar to uh, the justification of experiments, uh, that some people also say they are alternatives to experiments, and things of that sort. And at first, I, I, I was very dissatisfied with uh, those claims, um, because it was very conflicting with uh, 
the training I had in numerical analysis where we learn about all the ways things can go bad. And from this point of view, it's not quite clear that the justification would be like uh, that of experiments. But over time, as I was rereading those papers and thinking about all the uh, angles, it started to uh, be clear to me that what people who maintain those views and the, me, the sort of things I'm going to say, we're really coming at the same thing, but from very different directions. So I will try to explain a little bit why I think that those two points of view are not all that different. So in uh, computational physics, there's a distinction that is used very often between two aspects of the justification of computer simulation. On the one hand, people talk about verification, uh, where uh, we're checking that the code has been done properly and that the algorithm that has been implemented is uh, leading to a correct result. And on the other hand, there is validation, which is about justifying the accuracy of the results of computer simulation. And that can be by comparing with empirical data. So the first is an internal question, which has nothing to do with the relationship with the world. Whereas the second is precisely an external question where the relationship with the world is precisely what's at issue. So what we see from this distinction, whether we like it or not, it is not entirely uncontroversial, even if it's part of most of the guidelines, say, of the Department of Energy and things like that, is that there are different aspects of the justification of simulation, and they require different sorts of justification. All right. So I'm going to focus mostly on verification because well, that's what I know a little bit more about. And also because validation is so hard. <laughs> uh, all right, so one way, uh, one thing that's been suggested, uh, I saw that in a paper by Norton and by Smart, and I thought it was interesting, is to think about simulations as inferential patterns. Uh, the idea is uh, that from this point of view, verification would be really the same in essence as justifying particular inferences or more generally inferential patterns. In logic, we're used to doing that for those of you who spend days of teaching logic and things like that. We're used to doing that. We show that an argument is good either by making a deduction, using rules of inference that are, we know are sound and things like that. So what we're looking for if we we like this suggestion that computation are a little bit like inferential pattern. We're looking for a sort of extended soundness proof for the uh, inferential patterns that we are going to be using. And this is not going to be based on model theory, but rather on perturbation theory. Now, the first important difference between the way we talk about judging the soundness of inferences in logic and in numerical analysis is that in the context of computer simulations, we don't even know what the conclusion is. So we cannot just try to talk about the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. The problems that we are typically dealing with are not inferentially transparent enough to allow us to know what the conclusion is. So suppose we are trying to solve an a, a initial value problem. Our computer simulation is going to do two things for us. Well, hopefully. First, it's going to give us a computed solution, which is going to have an error, of course. That's the conclusion that we seek. And at the same time, we hope that the program can give us some guarantee that the conclusion that it has returned to us is, in fact, approximately approximating the uh, true conclusion. And uh, if it doesn't, then we like it when they give us a little error flag to say, hey, I'm giving you garbage. Um, so one interesting uh, thing uh, that's related to that, we often talk about the distinction between the context of discovery and the context of justification in philosophy of science. So when, in that particular case, uh, the context of justification and the context of discovery are, are the same, based on the very same process of uh, doing the computer simulation. And, um, yeah, so they are much more closely intertwined, uh, the, the context of discovery and justification, than is uh, 
normally assumed in the philosophy of science literature. Now, another distinction from Reichenbach that's going to help us to understand the nature of uh, this, the justification for uh, that is at work in the verification is the distinction between validation and vindication. I'm sorry, they all use those words. Validation here is not like in the v, uh, verification and validation literature. Uh, however, they, they kind of mean the same thing. Validation is about the justification of a factual proposition. So it's really about compa uh, comparing a, a statement with facts in the world. And now what we want to do when we are doing validation in that sense is to show perhaps that the statement in question is true uh, or approximately true or maybe probable or if it is false, well, that it is harmlessly so. Vindication, on the other hand, is a uh, process of justification that is not about a proposition but about a rule of inference or a pattern of inference. Reichenbach insists, and I think he's very right about that, that the, just the vindication type of justification is really a pragmatic business. It's, it is a goal-directed affair. We want to make sure that the rule or the pattern of inference is giving us what we believe that it is giving us. And in the context of logic, uh, we can think about truth preservation in this sort of uh, means and way where uh, if we start with true premises, we want to guarantee that we will have a true conclusion, so we would have uh, this. Reichenbach himself introduced the distinction to uh, justify a principle of induction. I'm not gonna go into details, but he wanted to argue that with a sort of dominance argument that using a certain rule of induction would lead us on average to do better science than if we did not. And uh, here, we have the exact same uh, sort of thing. The justification of simulation, to the extent that it is an inferential pattern, should also be thought as the justification of a rule, which is going to be a pragmatic affair. I think, though, that the uh, pragmatic character of this justification goes a little bit deeper than the mere uh, uh, goal-oriented analysis that uh, Reichenbach is discussing. There is uh, also a context dependency, which uh, in uh, the way we make the distinction between syntax, semantics, and pragmatics would fall within uh, the realm of pragmatics. Uh, because even if we believe, following those distinctions, that vindication is a, a sort of internal business, hopefully I will have time to show that properly understood error analysis, yes, it's a pragmatic justification, but it depends on uh, facts about systems. It depends on, oh, I, I changed those slides recently. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the idea is that there will be, uh, uh, to be absolutely important to uh, consider the sensitivity to perturbation of the system under consideration in order to assess whether the error is small enough. And a good framework to think about that, uh, it's a framework for error analysis, which is known as backward error analysis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but I knew that I would not have time, so I thought I will shamelessly plug some of the things that I've written with Rob Cordes. Uh, we have a paper in Synthase called On the Epistemological Analysis of Modeling and Computational Error in uh, the Mathematical Sciences. That's a philosophy paper. And then we have a big, big book uh, where we try to re-explain everything good in a numerical analysis from the point of view of backward error analysis. So let me tell you just a little bit, you know, to make you want to, to, to do some backward error analysis. To my knowledge, there's only three ways of measuring error. Of course, for each of those ways, you can use different norms, so that increase the number of ways. But we can talk about three concepts of error, forward error, backward error, and the residual. And to see that there's only three, and what the difference between them is, we can use a little bit of pedantic notation. Instead of just saying, representing a function or a problem as y equals f of x, we can say we send x to a set 
uh, that is uh, uh, defined using a certain equation, uh, which is going to be called the defining equation. So let me just give a couple examples of how this works uh, using stuff that I believe all of you will know. Solving a system of uh, a linear system will just be equivalent to sending two input arguments, a matrix and a vector. Yeah, I'm looking at it. To um, this set where we have a defining equation here. And we could do the same with the initial value problem. Now, of course, when we cannot con uh, solve exactly our problem, that's why we uh, run computer simulation, we engineer a problem which is going to be a modified version of the problem we start with. So again, if we take the case of the a linear equation, we would replace the defining equation that says ax equals b with something like x hat, the approximate x, is the result of executing Gaussian elimination without partial pivoting in double precision floating point arithmetic or things like that. And of course the difference between x and x hat in this context will be the computational error. The difference, uh, sorry, I should have, on the last slide, I should have said y and y hat to be consistent with that one. So the difference between the two is what's known as the forward error. When people talk about error without mentioning anything more, or accuracy or approximate truth, that's typically the sort of things that they have in mind. Now, how do we determine whether the forward error is small enough? In particular, we cannot measure it directly because we don't know what the exact solution is, so we cannot find the difference between the two. Now, fortunately, we have nice asymptotic methods to find bounds on the error, and uh, it reveals the most deep epistemological principle at the heart of numerical analysis, namely, finding the truth is harder than finding whether you're close to it. I think that's the biggest epistemological thing in numerical analysis. But even if we have a bound, it's not going to tell us whether the error is small enough. In order to do that, we have to explicitly refer to the context of modeling, and this is the second pragmatic dimension that I was alluding to earlier. And in order to exemplify it, I'm going to just talk about one of the most famous numerical analysis results, one of the earliest also, uh, by James Wilkinson, who uh, not accidentally was a postdoc working for Turing uh, in the good old days. So again, linear equation, that was the problem in question. And suppose you choose the algorithm that I described earlier, Gaussian elimination without partial pivot. What Wilkinson has shown is that if you solve this problem using this algorithm, you can show that there exists a matrix with relatively small entries for which this is an exact equation. So this is a computed solution. So what this shows is that we have solved, uh, we have exactly solved a problem with slightly perturbed entries in the matrix. So what we have done here, we have Instead of saying we have approximately so solved the problem ax equal, equals b, we have exactly solved a modified problem a plus e x equals b. And if this is compatible with our knowledge of the situation, you know where those could be empirically measured coefficients, then the, if uh, e is smaller than the error or the uncertainty on the measurement, then the solution for all we know could exactly represent the system that we are describing. So backward error analysis really focuses on understanding all the computational error in terms that could be reinterpreted as errors uh, about mo modeling assumptions or experimental errors or things like that. So I have to keep going. But when we do backward error analysis, instead of focusing on the difference between the, the exact solution and the approximate solution, we try to find a perturbation of the input data that has an exactly mathematically equivalent uh, impact on the situation. So the, the focus shifts from small forward error to solving slightly different problems, if things go well, again. Now, 
I was going to talk about the residual, which is a really cool concept of error uh, that allows us in many cases to do backward error analysis in a much more efficient way. We can even code it to make sure our programs are doing it automatically and there's nothing too uh, complicated about it, but I mean, there's no time of course, so I'll have to skip all this stuff. We can find a slightly perturbed vector field to which your computed solution is exactly tangent at all points. It's beautiful stuff. There is no point for that. You should definitely read the paper and the book. But here are some of the take-home message. I mean, I didn't have time to say all that much, but the justification of computer models is multifaceted. Uh, the sort of computational inference we want is a pragmatic justification, but it is not a purely internal affair. It depends on the sensitivity uh, of uh, perturbation for the, uh, for the system in question. So perhaps the distinction between validation and verification is not as sharp as one might think. And uh, yeah, that's going to be enough for now. I just want to make one last blog, shamelessly. Rob and I and Chris Mink are organizing a conference uh, in May uh, a joint conference for philosophers and applied mathematicians. Uh, it's co-sponsored by Rockman Institute and the Fields Institute. If that's the kind of thing that interests you, let us know and uh, we, we will uh, arrange something. All right? So thank you. I think that's in 20 minutes. I know, it was weird, but... Uh, yeah, that's really interesting, and I want to talk to you about that okay. conference. That sounds really cool. Um, so I want to push a little bit against the error stuff, just from the perspective of uh, climate modeling in particular. I'm glad Linda's here, because maybe she can correct me if I'm wrong about what I say about climate modeling. Um, it seems like everything that you're saying um, is certainly right if we're thinking about uh, computer simulations as the kind of thing that's just approximating um, some idealized uh, model if we're trying to solve like a differential equation or something like that, there's this clear definition of error. Um, for the really high level climate models, um, the big um, kind of coupled global uh, simulation stuff that we do, it seems like there's a relevant difference between that and trying to simulate the answer to um, some, uh, the solution to some kind of uh, system of uh, differential equations or something like that. Um, that is, there may not be uh, a clear sense of what the um, real world or actual answer is to uh, this sort of climate model, that um, there may not even be a way to think about meaningfully um, there being something other than the computer output. Um, and I think that's what draws people toward thinking about these as um, sort of contained experiments, as um, simulations being more akin to experiments when we're doing them for climate science than they are to um, uh, quick and dirty ways to solve um, uh, systems of equations or something like that. Um, so, does that sort of make sense? That there's yeah. an implied question there. I didn't actually ask a question, but just to get your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, in the context of climate modeling, for what I understand, we, we have a big issue because yeah, earlier they were talking about codes that are 500,000 or a right. million lines. But then there's a ton of subroutines in there, and we can, for all of them, ask whether they will give us results that are satisfactory in a backward error sense. And let me uh, re-explain slightly differently what that means. Uh, as Rob likes to say, uh, what backward error analysis tells us is that the solution that we have found, even if it's not exact, it is true to our assumptions. That is to say, it is compatible with the mod. So, we, we always have a certain amount of modeling or, or measurement error that comes into the construction of our model. And what this sort of error analysis does is it gives us an explicit means of reinterpreting the computational error in terms of modeling and experimental error so that if this, er this well, if the reinterpretation of the computational error is smaller than the perturbation that we should consider anyway based on physical or climate science consideration, then, I mean, th then if things don't work well, we cannot blame the computation. Okay. We, we have to blame the model that we are running. Is there a neat way to consolidate all the error from the subroutine to like a single answer? You know, like that's your say yes or no question? That's yes, yeah, that's okay. uh, provably, well, it depends what norm you're willing to use. But 
for some norms, it's probably the case uh, that you can consolidate them. Mm. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Wendy. Um, I, I guess I have a couple of questions, but they're mainly just questions of interest and ignorance. So one is just about the generality of that kind of approach, and you were just saying you could, at least in principle, do it for all the, all the parts. Does it depend on what kind of equations are in those parts? or Because you have to be able to find that, that nearby yeah. case, right? So I, I'm just wondering how general well, so th this thing started for uh, uh, fixed point and floating point arithmetic. Then Wilkinson worked a lot on uh, algebraic, uh, linear algebraic processes. Uh, in the 90s and the beginning of the year 2000s, and it's been generalized because the codes have become a lot better and new techniques have uh, appeared. So now it's uh, very standard, uh, well, it's getting increasingly standard for the solution of uh, uh, ordinary differential equations. Uh, it's also uh, starting to be used for boundary value problems, partial differential equations. Uh, it's used for interpolation. In fact, in our big book, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, show that, look, whatever you want to do, numerical integration, differentiation, interpolation, root finding, series algebra, all of that can be the, the the standard numerical analysis can be reinterpreted in light of the backward error point of view. Uh, Rob? I do want to say that there are a few problems for which it's not possible. Oh, and yes. It, it reminded me early on that there are, that it isn't quite a uh, panacea, however you pronounce that. For example, just out of product, you can't do backward error analysis on. There's too many answers or too few inputs to throw it back on. But if you have roughly the right number of inputs to outputs at any time you can do forward error analysis you can do back But you can still use the idea of residual as sure. a, as a uh, sort of a replacement. In any case, the, the sort of perspective is quite generally applicable. Uh, they, I mean, there are a few snags here and there, but by and large, it's going to be uh, possible to do that. I think uh, Bill had a question for someone. I I think it would be, I mean, I, I was interested in your using NICE when you talked oh. about doing it on a climate model. And you said, okay, we could go through, look at the different parts and do it. I think it would be really interesting and in, to get together with some climate modelers and pick a couple of candidates and then run it and see what the differences are between the two models when you've done this. I think that would be very informative. I doubt that it will be nice in the sense <laughs> that I think it's going to be really hard. Well, so so when, what I meant by nice is that often people are a little bit scared of uh, error analysis because uh, it requires a lot of asymptotic analysis and it can get quite complicated. But very often what we can do is just, so that's MATLAB code, we can just add a few lines of code and then, ch so, the idea is instead of doing a prior error analysis, consider your algorithm in advance and try to consider all the possible things that might happen. What you do is, well, write a code, use it, get a solution, and then use the solution that you have computed after the fact, a posteriori, to figure out whether you have done a good job. And this is quite a bit simpler uh, than doing this sort of, so this is what I meant by nice. Uh, it, it, it simplifies things and it gives bounds of errors that are very easily interpretable in the modeling context, which isn't true for many other approaches to error analysis. So Mark, we have this final question. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's almost the same one, I think, but given that it's so easy, I'd love to see you actually do it on a climate model and, and see what the results of that are. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I. I, I would love to. Uh, I, I was saying, I don't really know anything about climate. Because it has to be something you did jointly with the, yeah. With the climate. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I'm very interested in uh, getting there because, as I was saying, uh, I, I want to learn more climate science because the sort of uh, thinking about how taking computation seriously can change philosophy of science has, done, has been done mostly by philosophers of climate science. So, this is why I need to. Uh, I can just add one quick second to that. So of course the problem is scale, and 
have much, much larger computations and, and complicated PDEs and all kinds of things in there. And the verification process would at least be as large a computation unless we took uh, the uh, refuge in sampling. So just sampled parts of the verification applied this backward error analysis to parts of the thing. And of course, the fewer parts, the less confidence you have. The, the more parts, the more work. So, yeah, I mean, I'd also be yeah. interested in seeing that work. So you would be willing So if, if someone is interested and you have models uh, okay, well, that are not like a, a one year work just to get to understand the model, I would be interested. So uh, we can talk and, uh, yeah. But, but you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have to take the whole model. You just take dynamical core. And even, even, even more specifically, just focus on the implementation of the Navier service equations in there. Mm -hmm. And apply it to that. And, and, and you actually don't really have to know anything else at all about the rest of the model yeah. to be able to apply this. Why don't you guys get going on this? <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll make you do something further. <laughs> 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 All right. So we, we can talk after. Uh, I think we're out of time, yeah. and I don't want to take other okay, people's so. time.